boring, and you can see Brian is not complete AIDS. Wicked. Um, sag. Um, not my PowerPoint. Okay. Right, okay. So, um, we'll just talk about death for a bit longer then. Um, right um, oh. <laughs> so, here we are. Many ways to solve yeah. the problem of deafness. Many, many ways. Next one. And here we have yeah. the exact yeah. example of a really good way of doing it from one end to yeah. the other. Yeah. Yeah. D E A F? D E A T A. Oh shit. Um, <laughs> next one, please. Um, um, right. Um, I'll start again. Right. Um, yes. In 1958, um, I went to school in, in Newton, I was in, in Ireland, and um, I went to the New Model School. Here we are. And uh, my teacher, Mr. Laverty, uh, she taught us how to add up on abacus. And every time you get to the end of the line and you've got number 10, you've got given a suite. And it was kind of sponsored by the Newton Arts um, Dentistry Association. <laughs> and so um, one day we were in the school and um, she said, if you go outside, it's raining, it's windy, it's very dangerous. If the sled comes down and hits you on the head, you'll be dead. <laughs> now, that is a terrible thing to tell to a five-year-old. So imagine telling to a five-year-old that you can just wake up dead with no explanation, no reason why. And obviously, it affects me quite a lot. Now, more or less at the same time, my parents, well, there you are, see, I've taken it quite well, despite everything. See me, see No. <laughs> um, so, same time, I went to Guildford Cathedral. I was taken over there by my parents. And Guildford Cathedral had been started to be built in 1931, and they ran out of money in the war, and after the war, they did this thing where they said, you can buy yourself a brick, a brick for two and six, which is quite a lot of money, and put your name on it, and you'll help build the cathedral. And that's what I did. I, I bought a brick, I started building the cathedral. And so, what this is about today is about slates, getting slated, and bricks. And um, another thing happened not soon afterwards is that I was back in Newton Arts and my father ran a school and one day the, the cleaner went out, she left her home, probably left the gas on or maybe just leaking and she left it and the postman came along and he opened the, the letter box which brought just enough oxygen that then ignited and a huge explosion, more death, keep going. And um, <laughs> this started me, I mean I was only eight or nine, and suddenly thinking about, well, what could cause this to happen? Where, where does it come from? And is it no reason? It just happens? Or is it because other people are stupid? Or is it because other people are malicious? Or maybe just you being stupid, putting yourself in harm's way? And so it then suddenly you think, but what's the meaning of it all? I mean, if it's so easy to die, what's the point of life? And what is the meaning of life? And you then ask these questions, which you continue to ask in adolescence, particularly, What's important? How do, you, how do others think and feel? What's it like inside the head of another person? And what's truth? What's beauty? Is there a God? And um, how do you live with death? And at that time I was reading uh, Mark Twain and uh, he was said, the fear of death follows from the fear of life. A man who lives fully was prepared to die at any time. And that started me thinking, I'm now creeping into adolescence, just live life to the full. So, still love the explanation. And I was put into church, I, I sang in the choir, I rang the bells, but really God didn't convince me very much. But then I heard John Lennon and Yoko Ono, and I started to think, well maybe it's artists who can start making us think about what these things mean. And so John Lennon particularly, and here we go. And so uh, just going back to the battle match, that slide, I don't know if you know that slide, but what happened was that um, Yoko Ono had the steps going up and you came in, John Lennon walked into the gallery and you went up the steps and at the top of the steps there's a magnifying glass and you looked at the magnifying glass and she had written on the, on the ceiling, yes. And he felt that's such a positive thing, that's such an amazing thing to say that he then started a relationship which then famously 
um, got him very involved in art and politics. And her idea of, of the positive nature of art to, to make things great or better. And at the same time, in Paris, there's a group called the Situationist International, who were also artists but anarchists. And they, very exciting for a young 15-year-old, and they were talking about, well, let's strip away the, the fabric of the city and let's get, get underneath it. Sur les pavés de plage, underneath the pavement of the beach, pick up the bricks, chuck them to the police. And so that was a situation. I'm not writing this very well, but you know the idea. So, um, and then Gerhard Richter, who I actually discovered later in life, but then came back to what he was like in the 60s, and he said this very inspiring art is the highest form of hope. So, um, I left home, I'd been um, experimenting with drugs as a young man, and um, I went to uh, London, and I started selling copies of the International Times, um, and this is the actual front copy of the one I was selling at the age of 15 and a half, um, and it was, we are the people our parents warned us against. And, but then I started putting myself in harm's way, because I've had fun smoking hash, and then I thought it'd be really fun to um, drop some acid. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, but very <laughs> foolishly, I decided to drop some acid just before I started work at the Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> <laughs> the first one of its kind on King's Road. And um, when the chicken started coming alive and screaming and talking and all the rest of it, um, I decided I had to go. Um, but it did sort of. <laughs> It did sort of stop me thinking um, about lots of other things. And I went looking backwards in art, and I saw the pipe up by Greet, saying about a pipe, that's an interesting idea. No, it's not a pipe, it's a painting of a pipe. Um, <coughs> and I started with my, my granddad, who I was very close to, from the Greek. And my granddad um, was by then in his one or seventies, and he had um, gone into the war. And he had ridden into war, extraordinary. But you know, somebody I knew had ridden into war on a on a, a horse in 1917, at the same time as Duchamp put the fountain arm up um, into into the uh, um, gallery in New York. I was just so extraordinary that at the, the so 19th century on a horse in the battle, and that he was Duchamp changing the, 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 the whole idea of what art can be, saying that you could take anything. You could take an object, and because you're an artist, then that art, that object became art. So, um, here we go. Keep going, thanks. And then, uh, just racing forward a little bit, uh, 1972, I went to college, same time as Carl Andre sort of took the idea of, of uh, objects like this in a different direction and did this famous, the bricks and the tape, equivalent, uh, equivalent eight. And um, it was a really interesting piece of work. Uh, completely ignored until 1977, when um, it was discovered by the Evening Standard, who said it's just a pile of bricks, how disgusting, how much money have you wasted? And at the same time, in New York, they were saying a lot of people find profound meaning in this uh, abstract balance between the spiritual and the material, which manifests harmony, proportion, and pure order. So that was really made my mind think a lot of. And so I sort of, about the same time, I met what we, who you just met, and um, we got together, we, we decided to put together um, a festival, the uh, Bryant Contemporary Art Festival, and very important festival, because Roger selected <laughs> artists of the time um, who were really experimenting with what was the nature of art, and how art can particularly be articulated through performance. And so he is on the bill, Ian Hitchcliffe, Rob Conn, Roland Miller, Shirley Cannon, all these people were on the bill. At the same time, as Rod Stewart was seeing, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Two totally unrelated facts. Uh, <laughs> so, Ian Hinchcliffe was there, and he was putting himself in harm's way. And um, this is him with the policeman in Brighton. Um, so I slow my bricks. And um, at that time, I then did something really stupid. I... Oh, shit. I... Um, it's quite um, a delicate matter, this. And um, I bought myself a Ducati 900 GTS, fabulous motorbike, and um, I started racing down the road on it on a motorway. And uh, it was absolutely beautiful. And uh, about 85 miles an hour, it had a puncture. 
Uh, if you ever have experience, it is the first time I really, really looked at death in the face. And the whole bike goes like this. It's just like a, a, a hinge in the middle. Fortunately, I survived it, and um, I was uh, started to make art instead. And uh, inspired by Punk and Roger and Ian Smith and Curiosity and Andy Warhol saying, art oh, is what you can get away with. Um, a little break now. Homage to Roddy Heats from my personal selection of Roddy Heats work. Set for the States, on we go. Um, and so I set up um, a band of extremists in Igloo, uh, serious. Um, and um, we started playing with vocabulary and playing, you know, just creative vocabulary and playing with it. And so uh, here we go, the wild wigglers, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Uh, so um, this is myself and Ian, and uh, this is the focus of Agus. Let's keep building on here. And um, then we were talking a lot um, about creating reality and about how you can have the power to make your own reality. And so we set up this um, religion called the Formic Surfing. And the catechism was when two people gather together to share a myth, the myth becomes reality. And here we are um, destroying the surfboard in the name of art. And <laughs> this is Ian. And this is my mate Phil Hall, I'm at surfing with. And this is me. This is a moment nearly before death because I am wielding an axe, and a microsecond after this picture was taken, the axe head flew off, flew through a cloud, just like you, between people's heads, and clanged against the back wall. And it's just absolutely astonishing, very, very lucky. I learned a lot about health and safety. There <laughs> 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 we go. Um, and then I set up another band to one of this, Screaming Signs in Search of Utopia, not a good name. And, um, <laughs> then became interested in this idea that everybody's an artist and you have a social sculpture, very much influenced by um, Joseph Boyce, who famously um, created an arrow with loads of bits of basalt rock in the shape of an arrow. And at the end of the shape of the arrow, he then planted a tree, put the rock beside it, and the piece of work was that for people to remove the rock, but every time they removed a rock, they had to put it beside a new sapling of an oak tree. It's called 7,000 Oaks. And it's very poetic as the, the rocks went down, the trees went up. On we go. Um, but then, my next disaster, I was in uh, Brighton, where some of you, do you remember the hurricane, the famous hurricane? Yeah. yeah. And um, the famous story that the guy the, the, on the weather said there's not a hurricane, don't worry. Um, but there was. And what actually happened was that my house was just behind this church, and just beside the church, there was a building site, and on the building site there was great big cranes with a jib going across. And I woke up in the middle of the night and heard the storm, and the jib was going like that, right over my roof. Didn't die. Next one. Um, <laughs> this was dangerous. This is a long story. This is in the bar story, but essentially I got taken against my will in the Ukraine. Um, I was involved in, a, in putting on, on an arts festival on the flagship of the Ukrainian fleet, the Maxi fleet. And um, we'd done the work, I, was, I went in the taxi, I was taken into this area where I didn't know where I was, nobody knew where I was, I was taken to a flat, it was 40 degrees, and 50 Ukrainian men screamed at me to give them some money, and I took my way out of it, and I didn't die. There we go. <laughs> um, that was kidnapped. Um, by the way, these stories are probably true, by the way. Um, and then, I was sort of referring back to an inspiration of Hitler Lanzoni. Piero Lanzoni famously canned his ship. Yeah. And he, this is a can of his ship, well, it's a picture, this is not a can of his ship, this is a picture of a can of his ship. <laughs> and he um, then sold it for the same price in weight as gold. So at that time, gold, the, the weight of that can was, would have cost you $37 if it had been gold. Um, by the time, and, and of course, nobody would ever open it, because it's didn't open it and destroyed the work. And so there's all sorts of stories about it, but it is true, in 2007, one of those cans was sold for £97,250. <laughs> wow. So, next one, please. Um, so, I, Bantoni also proposed to draw a line around the meridian. So, I thought I'd do that for him, because um, he was dead by then. So, on the um, eve of the millennium, um, I did a project called Wrap the World, when, basically, um, we took a piece of paper, which is 150 foot long, here I'm drawing on it, we ran it into a fax machine that went over a table 
Uh, that was then dialed into Delhi, and in Delhi, into Johannesburg, sorry, first, and in Johannesburg, it went, came out of the fax machine onto a table, and the emerging fax then became the departing fax, <laughs> which was being faxed through to Delhi. But as it passed to the table, an artist in Johannesburg added to the marks that I was making in Glasgow, and you can see it's right there. And then it got to Delhi, and from Delhi, the same thing happened, and it went through to New York. From New York, it went to Sydney. From Sydney, it went to Porto. And from Porto, it then came back to Glasgow, where, just in the back bit, it started to emerge. And had it emerged, a child picked up the emerging facts and the departing facts and became a piece of work that backed the world. And Yay. So, um, on we go. And uh, then 2001, malicious intent, I was working in New York. Um, I went to, had a friend who was in the second tower. And the moment, the moment that the, she emailed us and said, it's okay, I'm in the second tower, that was the moment that the second tower got hit. And we spent, we were very, very lucky because we had been intending to go there. We had, she had offered us office space there and we were going to be there. We could have been there the day before, could have been there on the day, but on the day after, we were very lucky. On we go. Um, and then when all these things happen to you, you start thinking, well, how do you, the time you've left, that must define the value of time to you. How do you value your time? And so I sort of thought, well, if you're 20 and you've got 20 years left, then the next year is 5% of your remaining life. So, if you're 38, it's only 50% of your main life. So, what's actually happening is that every second, every minute you go through, that really, it gets more and more valuable. And every second I spend with you now, becomes more and more valuable. And, on we go. And so, I started thinking about how you punctuate your life. And some people punctuate their life by ending it, and in show this stuff, one way of doing it. But other people do it in a different way. And this is the great Dieter Mayer, the fabulous Ian Smith, a.k.a. Monty Cancer, and myself. And Dieter Mayer, for the, um, uh, 1972, he was at the Castle Documenta, and uh, he said, I am going, he took a plaque, he put it in the ground, he said, I am going to come on March the 23rd, 1994, between three and four, Dieter Mayer will stand on this plaque. That was a piece of work. He put it on the ground, 22 years before it happened, he went along, and on a day he stood there, the square was full of thousands of people who all agreed to come and watch um, over the years, over the 22 years. Um, so I invited him to Glasgow, and we invited him for dinner at Stravagan. So, can you come at 8 o'clock, please? Um, 8 o'clock he came, we said, Come over to this plaque, which is covered by a curtain. He opened the plaque, and it said, On the 30th of October 2003, at three minutes past eight, Lisa Mayer, Neil Butler, and Monty Capps will gave on the plaque. You know, typically. Okay. Um, so, moving on fast, Joseph Novi, I was surfing, went surfing Sri Lanka, acquired the small, modest hotel, and then on the next day, uh, when we were tonight, 2004, I was there with Roger, uh, we were in the hotel, and um, we were very, very lucky. 3,000 people within three miles of us. 3,000 people died, but not us. So, very, very lucky indeed. You can imagine lots of stories about that, not now. On we go. But one of the things we did is I set up with lots of friends a place called Chamber Savannah, which is a place for artists to come and live and work. And Ian lived and worked there. He made this piece of work. This is a quilt. On it are loads of stories from the day, from a record, and lots of Scottish tabloid stories about death and destruction and the horrible things people do to each other. So he said, Here we are. We are ill. Our people are ill. Here's a prescription pad. Help us. Can you give us a prescription to help us? And um, this was uh, Reverend Venable Rawatha, who was there for the occasion. Um, very beautiful piece of work, and so I'm never going to have done public sculpture. Um, as you can see, I'm a bit of a liability to hang around with. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is um, 2007, and I was in Sri Lanka. I just organised a Peace concert, ironically. <laughs> and um, what had happened is the Tamil Tigers had um, imported, in parts, 
loads of parts to make an aircraft, and they made two aircraft, and then they flew it down to Colombo Airport and just chucked bombs over the side. And I have to be there, having a vodka and tonic, and uh, a friend of mine, Barbara, who's down there at the front, I uh, was there in, in, in um, Sri Lanka working at Chandra Savada. Again, um, particularly nasty, malicious intent, somebody's out to kill me, off we go. Um, Graham Gilmer, fabulous friend, uh, this is a piece of work he made, Illuminating Links. Uh, I bring this up because Graham, myself, and Ewan, and uh, Ian, we're all working together, and on one famous occasion, um, Graham said, oh, I, just, I don't know how we're going to do this, how can we possibly do this, Ian? And Ian said, I think we'll use some artistic license. And Graham said, oh, that's what I want, I would like an artistic license. So, that night, Ian went home and he produced us all artistic license. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, as you can see, I'm quite dropped by the floor as well. Christian Eisenberger, isn't that great? Quite a good collection again, off we go. Uh, then, very recently, yeah, I managed to get myself ill. Um, dengue fever is really unpleasant. Um, all that happens is you get one little mosquito, the type that Roger was talking about, just comes along, has a quick nibble, and that's you. Uh, with dengue, it's really, really horrible, as you can see. But, as you can see, I'm here. And um, here we have Roger. Uh, another performance, now you've enjoyed it today, because him defying death on the road outside the hotel in Sri Lanka. So, here we are, moving rapidly towards the end. On we go. Um, so, um, for me, a sort of making art is, is really, in the end, trying to make sense of life. And, um, but the question that I always try to ask myself is, where is it? You know, where is the art? And but that question is like, the Yoko Ono sort of works like this, and the situation is like that, and Kalanjo like that, Ian Pinchcliffe like this, um, Joseph Boyce, keep going, yeah, mm -hmm. Ian Smith, and Graham, the Fountain, Magritte. <coughs> so, you then sort of say, well, I've been sort of trying to build this installation here. And, well, that wasn't a pipe, uh, and this isn't a table, but let's just look a bit more, keep going. Um, the thing about this is that th this is art, I've, I've made it, I've said it's art. Um, it exists for your imagination. It's what you were seeing there. And it's not actually necessarily what you see. It's not necessarily the fact of the installation. It's something beyond that. And what I think I want to say is that it's here, it's now, it's this moment that we've got at the moment. And can you see that? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so this is it. You just have to keep going up there. Absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. Please take another bow. Come on. Neil. What you have just created, absolutely sublime. This sculpture, your reminiscences, your knowledge, your experience. Thank you so much. Okay. Now we've got quite a.